Thank you for attending my presentation. I will be presenting my work on dynamic ductile fracture with thermal softening in a variational framework. I would like to thank Duke University and Sandia National Laboratories for supporting my research. It is common for a shear band to come before any fracture phenomenon form. This is evident in samples such as the iron sample shown here. This is a result of a compression test performed by Mason and Warwick to test the shear resistance of ferrous metals. The, descent, the sample has become highly deformed without any form of fracturing. It is, in, it is important to fully realize any shear band effects that may occur over the course of a simulation because of this. There have been significant advances in this field and in coupling ductile models with phase field for fracture. It is common to employ a criterion to force or direct shear band formation. However, in this presentation, we will propose a fully variational model for fracture that will enhance robustness and ease of numerical implementation. Here are a few recent works related to this research. These all employ an elastoviscoplastic model and mainly focus on brittle to ductile transitions. The reason for this is that this is that brittle to ductile transitions is where we wish to apply our research next. In the paper uh, by Chu and others, they implement a stress triaxiality condition. It is documented that shear failure is correlated to stress triaxiality. They use this correlation to create a condition to differentiate when their model should fail due to fracture or fail due to shear failure. In the work of Mihi and others, they introduce a critical plastic strain to, in to induce a locking of hardening to terminate the plastic flow of fracture, thus allowing for further fracture development even in regions with high ductile deformation. Ariaga and Wiseman demonstrated the viability of an eigenvalue criterion to predict shear failure for for, of an eigenvalue criterion to predict shear or fracture failure within a phase field framework for damage. Through this, they visualize the relationship between shear band failure and failure induced by damage. Now we're gonna go over some key points of our model. Again, we are presenting a variational model that is elastoviscoplastic for dynamic ductile fracture. No transitional criteria is employed to enforce shear band formation or influence direction. Through the work by, done by Jock and others, it is clear that a shear band can be regularized through the inclusion of inertial effects, thermal diffusion, and viscoplasticity. In their analysis, they show the inclusion of these terms to regularize shear band formation spatially and temporally. Thus, we have included these effects with the intention of regularizing shear band formation and developing mesh independent results. Here, we preview the results obtained with our model. The left figure displays the temperature field and the right figure displays the plastic strain field after shear failure. The width of the temperature field is larger than the width of the plastic strain field due to the effects of thermal conductivity in our model. Our variational formulation stems from the following Lagrangian. Here we include the effects of elastic contributions, plastic contributions, phase field contributions, thermal contributions, and then uh, energy dissipations. Through minimizing this Lagrangian, we, we arrive at our governing equations. Here we recover the equations for momentum balance, heat transfer, fracture evolution, and fracture evolution. Importantly, we have a momentum balance equation that includes an inertial term, as well as a heat transfer equation with a Laplacian, with a Laplacian. Of note are the delta and delta T terms, which provide heat generation due to plastic deformation and will be described in more detail later. From that strong form, we recover the following weak form. There are several important constitutive equations to discuss. As previously stated, this model uses the Johnson-Cook model for softening and hardening. The Johnson-Cook model is, a useful, is useful in modeling the hardening and softening curves of a wide range of high strength materials such as steel. This model has been improved upon its has been improved upon since its conception, but these improvements will make minute changes to the overarching behavior of our model. However, the implementation of these changes would be trivial due to the variational nature of the model. The Johnson-Cook model hardens based on plastic strain and plastic strain rate. The influence of these terms are modified by the parameters B and C. Softening is temperature dependent and is modified 
by an exponent m, as well as the melting and reference temperatures Tm and T0. Vp represents the yield function of the model. This is recovered from minimizing the Lagrangian with respect to the plastic deformation rate and plastic strain rate. This model features a split between energetic and dissipative energies. Here, Yaq represents energetic, the energetic portion of the flow stress, and Yvis represents the dissipative portions of the flow stress. The dissipative portions of the flow stress lead to the heat generation due to plastic strain. From the minimization of the Lagrangian, we also recover the terms delta and delta t, which represent which are, represent the implementation of the heat generation due to plastic formation and cooling due to thermal softening. These are featured in the source term of the heat transfer equation. It is important to note that the heat generation is rate dependent. High-speed ductile processes lead to large amounts of heat generation and vice versa. The Johnson-Cook model is implemented in a variational fashion. The aforementioned flow stresses are derivatives of the energetic and dissipative portions of the plastic energy. Here, psi p represents the energetic volumetric plastic energy, and psi p represents the dissipative volumetric plastic energy. These values are derived from the flow stresses, which are derived from the original Johnson-Cook model. Through this, the Johnson-Cook model is split into dissipative and energetic portions, the contributions from which are split by the taylor quincy the, the taylor factor Q. Typically, this, this Q value is around 0.9, meaning that the model is mostly dissipative. Adding the two portions of the dissipative and the energetic uh, portions of the flow stress back together will recover the original Johnson-Cook model. Uh, note that the softening term or the softening function f of t is unchanged through this derivation due to the fact that it is not reliant on the plastic strain or the plastic strain rate. Our model utilizes the cohesive model for fracture. This model allows for the tuning of mechanical parameters such as the elastic modulus and yield surface without considering fracture behavior, as well as an independence from the regularization length, which opens up, uh, which gives us freedom to refine the mesh as we see fit. The phase field model is coupled to plasticity through the coalescence function. This, this was proposed by Hugh and others, and it is a method of degrading the fracture toughness in a way that represents material degradation due to plasticity. Through this, microstructural defects are approximated and implemented at a continuum level. The coalescence function varies from a value of one and decreases in a pattern controlled by beta in the reference plastic strain. Beta modifies the minimum degraded value, and the reference value modifies the sensitivity of the function to plastic strain. Through this, the fracture toughness is decreased or degraded uh, with plastic strain and, and allows for the influence of plastic strain on the fracture pattern. A few key points about the discretization of our model. We utilize an HHT alpha time integration scheme to reduce the noise that comes with the inclusion of dynamics. Secondly, the isochoric nature of plasticity requires the implementation of a method to prevent volume metric locking in the, Q4, in the quad four elements used in our model. We use an FR method with quad four elements to overcome this issue. In our simulations, the momentum and heat transfer solvers are coupled monolithically. However, the phase field solver is coupled through an alternating minimization scheme. In this scheme, the relevant energies from the converged momentum and heat transfer solvers are passed, are passed to the phase field solver. The phase field solver minimizes based on the inputted energies. The phase field variable is passed back to the monolithic solver. This continues until a set convergent criteria can be reached in the monolithic solver in a single nonlinear iteration with the past phase field value. Now we will take a look at the benchmark problem that we will be simulating. The focus of the following test will be on the top hat problem. A top hat sample has two distinct regions where shearing is designed to occur, which makes this an ideal benchmark problem. Experimentally, this sample is put into a split Hopkinson rig. A compressive elastic wave hits the sample and causes it to shear in a manner shown in these images. Fracture can be seen in the left image at either corner of the sample, and the shearing can be seen on the right image. Here we simulate half the sample. 
The top and bottom of the sample are driven towards each other through a displacement boundary condition, while the right and left boundaries are held fixed in the direction perpendicular to the displacement. Displacement boundary conditions are implemented to cause a strain rate of about 1,000 per second. So this simulation occurs over only 30 microseconds. Shearing will occur in the region highlighted in red. For our formulation, we can pull the properties of a steel that is well described by the Johnson Cook viscoelastic model. This material features a high yield stress as well as a sensitivity to ductile effects. It is important to note that the thermal conductivity of the material is significantly increased from the parameters listed in the paper by Batra and Gomala. The thermal conductivity affects the mass resolution required to robustly capture shear band formation. Due to computational restraints, it was necessary to increase the required mass resolution to allow for successful simulations of the top hat sample. In later slides, we estimate the shear bandwidth and compare it to the mesh, mesh resolution. To do this, we use an estimate proposed by Don and Bai, which calculates the shear band half width based on the thermal conductivity, the temperature increase within the shear band, stress within the shear band, and the rate of deformation within the shear band. This value is typically between 0.1 and 0.01 millimeters for a typical steel. For this mesh conversion study, we only consider the region surrounding the expected location of shearing. This is done to reduce computational expense. In this figure, you can see the typical shearing pattern, which is a close representation of what is observed in this region experimentally. In the following charts, we are, able to, we are taking data as a function of the location over the pictured red line. This way, we are able to see the behavior over the width of the shear band. We will present two cases of this, one with thermal conductivity included and one without. This is, this is done to emphasize the effect that thermal conductivity has on the behavior of our model. These three charts show the behavior over the shear band of the displacement parallel to the shear band, the temperature, and the plastic strain. Here we plot simulations that contain mesh increasing mesh resolution relative to the predicted shear band width, ranging from 80% of the width uh, to 1200 or 1200% uh, of the width. The gray regions highlight the estimated width of the shear band. The data for all mesh resolutions were taken at the same point in time. First, without considering mesh conversions, we see the expected shear band behavior. The region is characterized by um, a zone of high displacement, a rapid increase in plastic strain, as well as a temperature increase with the temperatures reaching around 500 Kelvin. Spatially, the meshes are in agreement to the width of the region influenced by the shear band. The estimated width of the shear band lies around the most intense change in properties in the simulated shear band. Finally, the maximum value of the, the extreme values in the shear band are increasing with mesh refinement. However, they are most certainly uh, converging on a single value. Um, and this is shown better in the next few slides. Now we see the results without thermal conductivity. It is immediately obvious that the spatial convergence of the shear band is no longer reached. The, difference, the different mesh resolutions are no longer in agreement to the width of the shear band. And this is most obvious in the displacement chart where the severity of the displacement is correlated with the mesh refinement. Additionally, the discrepancy between peak values is significantly magnified, resulting in the most refined mesh to display characteristics far more extreme than its predecessors. Here, we look at the trends of peak values within the shear band as we increase mesh refinement. The left chart displays the maximum temperature, while the right chart displays the maximum plastic strain. The red lines show the results without thermal conductivity, while the right lines, the red, the, the blue lines display the behavior, or the, the blue lines display the behavior with thermal conductivity. Here, there is a clear differentiation in behavior between the model that includes conductivity versus that without. Without much doubt, it can be stated that the mesh convergence will not be reached when thermal conductivity is neglected as both cases feature a diverging curve. The final behavior of the case with uh, thermal conductivity can also be seen as 
In both cases, it is very clearly asymptoting onto a single value. Uh, this shows a strong argument for the mesh conversions of our model, even after shear band collapse. Here we see the simulation of the full model. The shear band forms in the expected region and in the expected path that is, that is shown in the experiment. The plastic strain begins as a diffusive pattern at each corner of the expected shearing region, matching the stress concentrations that arise out of the elastic portion of the model. As the model is continually compressed, the plastic strain then localizes to the top right corner of the upper curve and at the bottom left corner of the bottom curve. A distinct band is formed across the shearing region. This, however, is not the final state of the shear band. As observed on a torsional experiment on HY100 steel by Mark Hand and Duffy, a full collapse is preceded by a wider region of plastic strain. The stress drop that is characteristic of shear collapse is not seen during this stage. It is not until another stage of localization occurs where a stress drop in the material is captured and the final width of the shear band is realized. This transition is clearly seen in the simulation and it speaks well to the validity of the model. Here, we look at the results after the inclusion of phase field physics. The plastic strain field is still shown, but elements with a damage value of over 0.9 are removed in post-processing. This is purely visual and no element deletion is done uh, during the course of the simulation. The previous plastic strain pattern is seen up to the point of the second stage of collapse. At this point, fracture begins to form and penetrates the existing shear band. The two halves of the sample are then separated. Are, are then separated. The combination of shear banding and fracture and fracture formation are in good agreement with the aforementioned experiment. In conclusion, we have presented a variational model for dynamic ductile fracture. This is beneficial as it allows for straight a straightforward numerical implementation. We have presented a, a clear, uh, a strong argument for the mesh convergence of our model. And then additionally, we have shown a close resemblance between simulation and expected experimental and experimental results. Um, thank you for listening. Uh, here are my references. And I hope you have a good day. Thank you.